Well, welcome to another MedCram lecture. We're going to talk about pulmonary hypertension. This is an interesting topic. There's been a lot of developments recently. So let's get talking about pulmonary hypertension. So you have to know the definition first of pulmonary hypertension, and there's a couple of ways of measuring it. The first one is looking at the mean pulmonary artery pressure. And the other one is looking at the systolic. This is how you measure it, and by definition, it's by the mean pulmonary artery pressure. And generally speaking, if it is greater than or equal to 25 millimeters of mercury at rest, or greater than or equal to 30 millimeters of mercury at an exercise, that will meet the criteria for you having pulmonary hypertension. Systolic is used when we are trying to estimate using echocardiogram, and we'll talk about that. Echocardiogram. Okay, so there are major different categories for pulmonary hypertension. Let's talk about those. So these are the five different WHO groups. This is the World Health Organization. They've divided pulmonary hypertension into five different groups. So what are the different groups? The first one is actually termed as pulmonary arteriolar hypertension. And the key there is this word arteriolar because all the other ones are really just PAH or PH, I should say, pulmonary hypertension. And we'll talk about those. But PAH has to do with the artery. So why is the artery enlarged? So this includes the term, uh, what it used to be known as is primary pulmonary hypertension. So I'll just put primary pulmonary hypertension. But specifically, it's idiopathic pulmonary hypertension. So this was typically in young women and um, really couldn't find a reason for why the pulmonary artery pressures were enlarged. But then it also included some secondary forms of pulmonary hypertension that having to do with collagen vascular diseases, HIV, portal hypertension, even schistosomiasis, chronic hemolytic anemia, persistent pulmonary hypertension of the newborn, even pulmonary veno-occlusive disease, or even pulmonary capillary hemangiomatosis. So those are some of the more uncommon ones. I think the one that you really need to focus in on is this idiopathic pulmonary hypertension, okay? But the reason why I include all of these in here is because the medicines that we're going to talk about really are for group one. There is another one that fits into group four, which we'll talk about. It's a new one. But generally speaking, the new medications and even the old medications that we have for pulmonary hypertension really are for this type. So if you've got patient that's got pulmonary hypertension in one of these other categories, with maybe the exception of number four, these medicines really haven't been shown to be very beneficial. So uh, things like idiopathic pulmonary hypertension, um, there's even one, uh, now that we're thinking about it here, that has a, a gene called the bone morphogenic protein receptor type 2. Okay, so type 1 is a huge massive group of different types of idiopathic pulmonary hypertension. So let's talk about number two, because these are all different. Two is pretty simple. It has to do with left heart failure. Okay. Number three has to do with lung disease. Okay. So that would include COPD. That would include idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Uh, we can think of a whole bunch of other things, even sleep diseases like obstructive sleep apnea. Okay, so things that causes hypoxemia. Alveolar hypoventilation disorders like obesity hypoventilation, um, things of that nature. Group four has to do with pulmonary embolism and chronic VTE. Now, there's a medication that we'll talk about that actually is approved for WHO4. And then finally, five was kind of left there for those that are unclear. So hematological disorders, myoproliferative disorders, splenectomy, sarcoidosis is one. 
glycogen storage diseases, fibrosing mediastinitis. How about chronic renal failure? Okay. So what I want you to take home from this is number one is PAH. It has to do with the artery. It's pulmonary arteriolar hypertension. And the biggest one that fits into that category is the idiopathic pulmonary hypertension. But there's also collagen vascular diseases, etc. cetera. Uh, number two, left heart disease. Number three, lung disease. Number four, pulmonary embolism. Number five, sort of the grab bag like sarcoidosis. Um, there's also amphetamines, which can also fall into type 1. And so amphetamines. Okay, so we've divided these up into the different categories. Let's actually talk about now some of the physical diagnosis findings. How do you actually diagnose pH? And then the treatment for pulmonary hypertension in this and the next videos. So let's move on to some of the physical findings. Okay, let's talk about the heart sounds. The first thing that you're going to notice here is that there's going to be a loud P2. And that's because of the pulmonary hypertension that is closing very hard the uh, pulmonic valve. The other thing that you're going to notice is a murmur of tricuspid regurgitation, which remember is holostolic. You're also going to have right ventricular heave that you might feel. On JVP, because of the pulmonary hypertension, you're going to notice larger CV waves, okay? Otherwise known as regurgitant waves. And it's this regurgitation that allows you to estimate the PA pressure. The liver is going to be pulsatile. The legs are going to have edema. And on chest x-ray, what you'll notice is something we call pruning of the blood vessels. So in the middle of the chest, whereas normally you would see these blood vessels go out, what happens is because of the pulmonary hypertension is these blood vessels don't go very far. They stay in the middle, they're enlarged, and they stay in the middle. And then for the most part, the periphery is generally free of blood vessels. So this is almost this oligemia uh, or darker lung fields on the peripheral chest x-ray. Okay, so what would you think you might see on a uh, EKG? So on an EKG, what you would expect to see is right ventricular deviation. So an RVH, maybe a right axis. The other thing that you would see is an enlarged right atrium. So if you remember in lead two, you would have a peaked or a tenting P wave. Okay, that would be what you would expect. Also, if you have right ventricular hypertrophy, remember in lead V1, you're probably going to see a large V wave. You might even see a right bundle branch block, depending on how much enlargement there is. However, the biggest thing that you're going to see is an echocardiogram. And what, what's going on here is if we were to look at the heart, here's the right side. And here's the tricuspid valve. If we get an echo machine, an echo probe, which is looking exactly on that tricuspid valve, every time that right ventricle contracts, it's got to pump blood into the pulmonary outflow tract. And to do that, it has to overcome the pressure to get the blood into the pulmonary artery. Well, when that happens, the pressure here in the right ventricle is going to be equal to the pressure in the pulmonary artery. Well, this tricuspid valve may not close completely. And so what's going to happen is you're going to get a tricuspid regurgitant jet going away from the probe. Now, if it's going away at a zero degree angle, then we can directly measure the velocity of that regurgitant jet. And that velocity is related, secondary to the modified Bernoulli's equation, to the pressure that's in the right atrium. The fact that the right atrial pressure is lower means that there's going to be a regurgitant in jet. The difference between them is going to affect the velocity of that wave. And the way it's affected is that the, the change in pressure is equal to four times the velocity squared. So if we know what the velocity is, let's say it's three meters per second, we can square that, which will give us nine, and multiply it by four. And in that case, nine times four would be 36 millimeters of mercury.
So this becomes very helpful in estimating. This is an estimate of what the PA pressure is. To this, this is the difference between the right atrium and the right ventricle. So what you need to do is add the pressure, the absolute pressure that is in the right atrium, so you'll know what the actual pressure is in the right ventricle. So for this, we add the RA pressure. Now we estimate that by looking at the IVC. If the IVC is very distended, then we give it a 15. If it's moderately distended, we give it a 10. If it's collapsible, we give it a 5. And we simply add it to the 4V squared number. So echocardiogram is very helpful. So what is echo good at doing? Number one, it's good at estimating the pulmonary artery systolic pressure. Not the mean, but the systolic pressure. We talked about that before. Number two, it can also measure things like the right atrial size and the right ventricular size to show how long this has been going on for. Because the pressures on the right side are higher than that on the left, the question then, then becomes, is there a patent foramen ovale? And to do that, you're going to have to inject bubbles, so you can do a bubble study. And that's very helpful to see if there's a shunt process going on. The other thing that has to be done is when you want to confirm this, is you want to do something called a right heart catheter. Now, right heart catheter is when you stick the catheter down into the right atrium, into the right ventricle, and then out through the pulmonary artery, and you actually measure now what the pulmonary artery pressure is. So here you get an actual measurement of the PA pressure. This is not the systolic pressure. We're going to get the systolic, we're going to get the diastolic, and we're going to get the mean. And that's where we can find out if the patient actually has pulmonary hypertension. So before we actually treat anybody, we really want to make sure we have a right heart cath. The other thing that a right heart cath allows us to do is to wedge the balloon catheter into a pulmonary artery so we can figure out what the left atrial pressure is. And if the left atrial pressure is less than 18, that means it's not due to left ventricular failure. And so that would rule out a group two and would rule in a group one. And the pressure that we're looking for there is approximately around 18. The mean artery pressure, again, what we kind of want that is to be above 25 millimeters at rest and 30 millimeters with exercise. Okay, well join us for our next video where we talk about the treatment of pulmonary hypertension. Mm -hmm.